Hey, good evening. Welcome to GMC Online for our evening encounter service. It is a time when we pray, we hope you will encounter the risen Christ. You will have an encounter uh, with God through our worship, through our singing. Uh, we love singing at Gillespie. We love singing our praises to the Lord. Uh, we just even love clapping along, humming, uh, or, or just soaking in the music and the words that uh, can wash over us. It is a time in an evening service a, a bit more reflective, but uh, this encounter through 2020, we are considering uh, the gospel and the pagan world. We are dealing with Paul's uh, visit in Athens, his uh, time at the Areopagus uh, on Mars Hill and his sermon there and understanding how today Christians can encounter God and take that encounter out into the marketplace, into a society today and proclaim Christ. Uh, so let us just still ourselves, let's come before God as we wa want and come to worship him. Father, we do come before you this night. We lay aside uh, the stuff of the day, whatever has gone on for us on this Sunday or whatever day of the week we happen to be watching uh, this uh, service on YouTube on the Gillespie website. Father, we lay it aside we give thanks for your presence, we give thanks for your glory, we give thanks for uh, your sovereignty over our lives. Father, we surrender to you and we come to you to worship, for we know our God saves. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Spirit, Lord, we come, we're gathered together to lift up your name, to call on our Savior, to fall on your grace. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Spirit, Gathered together to lift up your name, to call on our Savior, to fall on your grace. Hear the joyful sound of our offering as your saints bow down, as your people sing. We will rise with you, lifted on your
God of salvation, Father, you come to save. You come to save us through the presence and power of your mighty Son. Father, we give you thanks. We come before you in praise and glory, laying down our brokenness, our lives before you. Father, wash us clean. Make us clean in the blood of your Son so that we can honour you and glorify you and we can praise your name through worship tonight. Father, come into our hearts and our homes in your presence, the power of your Spirit now. Come and be with us in Jesus' name. Amen. There is power in his name for the storm was rolled away mountains bow down before jesus christ our risen lord jesus christ our Mighty Savior, lifted high, King forever, Jesus Christ, crowned in glory, raised to life, the same
So today's reading uh, continues in Acts 17 uh, today, verses 22 and 23, as we continue in our encounter series, uh, The Gospel and the Pagan World. Hear the word of God. Chapter 17, starting at verse 22. Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To an unknown God. So you are ignorant of the very thing you worship. And this is what I am going to proclaim to you. Thank you God for the reading of your holy word to your name be praise and glory. So Paul 
Well, he now finds himself addressing the learned people of the Areopagus, and he lays a different charge before these people, a charge that they have an altar to an unknown god. Uh, but let's first set a, a scene, uh, a reminder of what Paul's been up to in Athens. He's been going around the city. He's seen unbelievable levels of idolatry on display. I talked about that in a previous uh, encounter service. He's preached in the synagogue, reaching the Jews of the city with the gospel message. He's taken the same message out to the marketplace and he's reasoned with local philosophers, the Epicureans and the Stoics. Now Paul's taken to the Areopagus, a place where learned minds gathered and debated. And then at verse 22, which we've just heard, we come to Paul's sermon, famous sermon, uh, where he delivers gospel wisdom. In fact, he's more than delivers. He's compelled to deliver it. But the audience have no background in faith. They don't have the language of the Hebrew scriptures. They're not a Jewish audience. They're not even God-fearing Greeks who knew something of the ways of the God of Israel, the creator God. For these hearers of Paul's, there's no point of reference. So how does Paul communicate? And that, I guess, is a key question for us to consider today. Uh, and we can learn as Paul starts to preach over the rest of the encounter services this year, we'll be going through this sermon and we will start to pull out and understand how Paul uh, delivers uh, the gospel message to people who uh, have no background. And I guess the starting place is understanding who the audience is, who the hearer is, and trying to find some commonality. Paul needs an understanding of their worldview in order to speak the truth of the gospel into his hearers' lives. So he doesn't bother starting in the Old Testament scriptures to show that Jesus is the fulfillment of prophecy, which of course Jews would have had some understanding of that. That God's revelation to humanity was planned and culminated in Christ. This would have had no resonance with the Athenians. Paul instead begins to build a case in his sermon. As I've said, we'll work through it the rest of this series. But his case is founded on the truth that there is one God. But he seeks points of common agreement so that he can point to the person of Christ and the resurrection. And I guess it's that transition from one point to the next that we must learn in our pagan world when we witness to Christ. So we need to use examples that people will understand. Explain that the idolatry in the world is creating their own gods. Uh, people might not understand the word idolatry. But even for unbelievers, we can point out the reliance upon things that are temporal, that, that are not God. Maybe establish common ground. Uh, and there's no more common ground that understanding the world is broken that we are broken. We don't have to look far to find evidence of that. We can use our own story or there's plenty of stories, especially at the moment going on in the world, showing how broken it is. And then I guess it's pointing forward to a solution for that brokenness, a decision for Christ, that grace and mercy are free that, and they're life changing. If only people could truly grasp the enormity of what God has done for us all. So back to Paul, he, he notes that his hearers are religious. After all, he's found objects of religious worship everywhere. He's wandered the city, he's come across, I guess, temple shrines to various gods, altars set up for sacrifice for all eventualities. And as he says, even an altar to an unknown god. And I guess that's kind of a safety net, a just-in-case god, uh, just in case they were missing out on some blessing or fearful of receiving some punishment, they've got to have a God there just in case. So he finds a commonality in religiosity, a common point of interest upon which dialogue can be based. And I guess we need that commonality because it's impossible to talk anyone into the kingdom. We must accept and understand that that privilege alone lies with God and the Spirit moving in people's lives. But we can dialogue. 
We can find common ground by giving people a chance to speak. We don't just speak at them, we listen. And that's hard today. So much of society is an echo chamber. We just hear folks drowning out what they don't agree with and instead just seeking, whether it's in social media or only to watch the news channels that will give them agreement with their position. This sermon, I guess, is not a uh, place naturally where I could discuss the situation in the US at this time. But I will say anger and frustration boils over when people are ignored. Their plight, their rights, historic injustices, when they're not heard. And more importantly, when they are not addressed. And so what is the response of Christians? Um, I guess it should be that we address people with and in the love of God. And the recognition that all are equal under the word of God, under his sovereignty. We are all equal under his truth. If you're listening to me and wondering what that truth is, what I think it is, um, as a church, we post up our Christian beliefs, our core beliefs, in detail on the our belief section of the Gillespie website. I'll put details up on the bottom. Um, but the essence is this. We, are, we all humans are sinful and separated from God, yet in his mercy we find salvation, redemption through uh, the death of Christ on a cross, and find new life in his resurrection. And that is really the truth to which Paul speaks of. It's why he must connect with his hearers. And actually, it's the way of Jesus as well. Jesus had a deep understanding of all who crossed his path, all who sought his help. Each he approached differently. Just think of a few of his eating with sinners at Matthew's house or the healing of the paralyzed man by the pool of Bethesda. The blessing of the little children. The confrontation with Pharisees and Sadducees, the leaders of the Jewish religion. Or even the rebuking of his own disciples. For each situation, Jesus had the right words, the right actions, tempered to each person. And I guess that what that says to us, there is no stereotyped way to communicate the gospel. Alpha works, the Alpha curse work, course works, but so does Christianity Explored. Or maybe a quiet invitation to listen to a service, to a friend or a neighbour, come listen, tune into Gillespie. Or maybe an invitation when we can gather again, to come to a group discussion, a book group, for a coffee, for a chat, or just plainly sharing your own story. Whatever the, uh, the method, we though need to have a grasp of the message. The technique is not important, but the message that leads a person to faith in Jesus Christ is. And this is ever more important when we deal with people with no background of faith. Um, I'm just thinking, I guess a true atheist is a rare beast. I, I believe that most people who say no to religion are not atheists, but agnostics. It seems um, especially so today. Maybe it's always been like that, that people can't find the time, the energy to find out more. They don't see faith, maybe specifically the Christian faith, as relevant to their life, so they don't give it any time. Yet people do have a religiosity about themselves. When Paul says to the, the listeners at the Areopagus, I see that in every way you are very religious, He's not meaning it positively, but rather that they were superstitious, that there's a deeply ingrained understanding in the human psyche that there is something more, that there is something out there. I mean, why today do people put their trust in horoscopes, in tarot cards, in spiritualist mediums, or uh, touch wood for luck? Really? People believe in something other than the physical world most times 
and the writers of the New Testament, Paul being one of them, wrote much of the New Testament, assume that humanity has some religion, no matter how debased or distorted it may be, that there is something beyond themselves in which they place their trust. And I guess for uh, it's always been that way for humanity. So I'd say religion is the normal and atheism is abnormal. I mean, just think about countries that have tried to instill atheism the bedrock of as a bedrock of their rule uh, the soviet union and eastern bloc of the cold war or pol pot's cambodia the current sung political dynasty in uh, north korea or even the cultural revolution of mao zedong in china none of these re regimes were able to quash completely and destroy the christian faith it survived or is still surviving in the case of north korea and it grows under persecution and think there are few atheists in a crisis i think about the chilean miners disaster it's it's uh, you hear about it on the alpha course um, from the people who were there the 69 i think miners who were uh, no it was 69 days of captivity I'm not sure how many miners 30 somethings down there but they turned to the eldest member of the team, Mario Gomez, to lead them in daily prayer, to spiritually counsel them uh, in their 69-day captivity. They even set up a chapel underground in facing death. There were no atheists. They needed something to hold on to. And this is what Paul sees the, in the Athenians, that they are reliant even upon an unknown God, worshipping in ignorance. Jesus says the same of the Samaritans. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. After the villagers have come to Jesus at the well where he's been with a Samaritan woman. So the implication is that folk are satisfied with a God who is not just unknown, but unknowable, so they think. And actually, that is the term for agnosticism. An agnostic is someone who believes that nothing is known or can be known about the existence of or the nature of God. But what Paul means by the worshipping of an unknown God is not focused on the worship of the unknowable, but rather on the futility and ignorance of such a worldview. It was not a case that God was unknowable, but rather the Athenians had failed to find him, the true God. And it's like that for so many today. People search for meaning, they search for truth, but they come up empty-handed. Their hearts are wanting and desiring relationships that comfort and do not bring them to distress. They want relationships that build up and do not tear down. They want relationships that love and do not hate. People are looking for shalom. Whether they realise it or not, that's what they are looking for. Shalom is a Hebrew greeting. It means both hello and goodbye. But it's so much more. It is peace. It is wholeness. Completeness. Harmony. Health safety and prosperity but not in a human sense for shalom rests with god so when we as christians come and talk to other others about the difficulties of life their concerns and their own search for spirituality of life amongst whatever it is they're looking for whether it's in uh, the scientific world or uh, mumbo jumbo spirituality if that's where they're trying to find peace i would say i will say with assurance that they will not find peace because attempts to find meaning outside of god will fail attempts to find justice outside of god will also fail as will peace or meaningful relationships Christianity offers so much more than unaided human speculation on the answers of life. Life, shalom, is found in God who was born on earth in the person of Jesus, revealing himself and his way to salvation. 
but what of those who don't accept the authority of the Bible that reveal this to us, or even Christians who doubt the veracity of the Bible, uh, doubt its inspiration and authority? Can we use the Bible to prove the Bible uh, that creates a circular argument? Well, no, not really. And Paul didn't do this. At the Areopagus address, Paul spoke in a language that the, his listeners understood. He didn't reference the Old Testament. He didn't, like, like he would in the synagogue where he would quote scripture, those people would knew. Instead, he quotes from Greek poets and has an analysis from Greek philosophical thinking. We'll get onto that in, in later uh, encounters. But it's also why we need to grapple with people's worldview in order to be able to speak with them. Thinking about the current situation in the US, it's what it's why for me as a white male, it's hard to grasp with racism, with feminism, because I'm not black, Asian or any other minority and I'm clearly not a woman. But that said, it doesn't mean I have to be quiet on the subject. It doesn't mean I can't ha have a view, empathise, understand others' issues, even if I haven't directly faced it myself. Why? Why? Well, because I can come with the perspective of Christian faith and speak truth from the word of God and my experience, my personal experience, of forgiveness for my sin. The forgiveness that has led me to proclaim from the least to the greatest, all full surely of the glory of God. We're all equal. All leaders, all people, all nations are equal under God. Just so many people fail in realising that. That, that all humanness is broken, all arguments, all injustice is based in the deep sin of humanity. It's based on pride. The pride of, oh, we know better. We know better than God and better than others. It, humanity wallows in its pride and look, look where it gets us. It gets us about as far away from shalom as can be got. And so instead, all I can do is point to God. But some might say, how do I know that God is Father? That he's righteous and he loves us, his creation? Can I turn to my own feelings and my own reasoning? Well, no, because that's changeable in our finite world. Instead, the reason I give for believing these things of God is that, that God... The discovery of him is made upon the person and life of Jesus. That's how we point to God. That's what Paul proclaims. He declares, I even found an altar with an inscription to an unknown God. Yeah, we know that. So you are ignorant of the very things you worship. You worship an unknown God. You're, you're ignorant. And then, and this is what I am going to proclaim to you. That word proclaim is important. I'm not going to go into the Greek of it. I don't really want to do that. But it, 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 the root of it is gospel. Paul is going to talk the gospel to it. But what he's emphatically saying is, I, I am going to bring the gospel. Proclaim to you the good news. That strongly affirmative I. I am a witness. I witness to events and I share them with you. In 1 Corinthians, Paul lists a bunch of people Jesus appeared to after his resurrection. First to the disciples, then to 500 others, and then to James and the apostles. And then he says, last of all, he appeared to me also. And so that was Paul's qualification to share the gospel. But what about us, who have not had that face-to-face -face contact with Christ to who or what do we appeal for our witness? Well, it is to the apostles. I guess I'm contradicting myself because to do that we go to scripture. 
But Jesus himself expects Christians, subsequent, those who came after the apostles, to believe through them. In his prayer for the disciples in John 17, he says this, I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, their being the apostles. So Paul was claiming legitimacy for his words from his call from Jesus on the Damascus Road, his meeting with him. And that what he said and what he wrote was at the Lord's command. He may not uh, quote scripture to pagans and non-believers from the Old Testament, but he did preach the living, resurrected Christ. And of course, there was no New Testament when he was writing and speaking because it was being created as people lived in the years after Jesus. But he was preaching the core of the New Testament, the living and resurrected Christ. So although I said we can't use the Bible to prove the Bible, because that just won't change hearts, quoting scripture to people. But neither can we change hearts of Christ by ignoring it. We must know and be certain of our faith so that we can confront non-believers with the claims of the New Testament apostles. And actually we shouldn't shy away from doing it in a multi-faith context too. These, these truth claims of the gospel are singular truth. There's, there's no many ways to God. I am the way, the truth and the life, says Christ. We stick to that and we do not divert, divert from it. So whether addressing nominal Christians or those of other faiths or no faith at all, we do one thing and we proclaim Christ, Saviour, Redeemer and risen and ascended. We proclaim the resurrection. But before I just finish off, I want to leave you with a thought about shalom. In these times in which we're living, that shalom, that deep peace in our soul is important. I came across this uh, peace when I was doing some research and it was the difference between a Roman view of peace and I guess for that we could say a pagan a current world view of peace and what the Hebrew shalom means in these uncertain times one can dictate a peace shalom is a mutual agreement peace is a temporary pact shalom is a permanent agreement one can make a peace treaty. Shalom is the condition of peace. Peace can be negative, the absence of commotion. Shalom is positive, the presence of serenity. Peace can be partial. Shalom is whole. Peace can be piecemeal. Shalom is complete. May you know the shalom of the Lord Jesus in your hearts and in your working and in your waking, may you bring this peace to all those you encounter. Amen. God, give me a song. I will sing for the rest of my life. Jesus is the light, the light of the world. Come, let us celebrate Him. Lift up your voices and sing. Jesus is the light, the light of the
Mighty Lord, gracious Father, we give you thanks for your word. Father, we give you thanks for your presence among us. Father, we give you thanks for Holy Spirit. Father, in our broken world, in this screwed up, messed up, prideful, hateful place, God, Father, we beseech you, come. Come among your people. Come for shalom, for peace, for love, for grace, for mercy, Father, for we need it. We need it more than ever. In our broken world, Father, will you come among us? We pray this evening, we beseech you, come to your broken and oppressed people. In Jesus' name, amen.
Now may your rising soul survey the mercies of your God. May you be lost in wonder, love and praise, so that through every period of your life, his goodness you will pursue until our Lord comes again. Until our Lord comes again. May you know the blessing of God the Father, the love of Christ the Son, and the power of the Holy Spirit working in and through you now and forevermore. And all God's people said, Amen. <laughs>